job for us that must love smell of pine. <laughs> Dead pine. <laughs> Dead pines. <laughs> So how many chunks do they cut at a time? Do they have a... It depends no. on the uh, angle of the boom. Uh -huh. The farther it gets out, the less weight we can take. So, you know, if we got it straight up... Do you have questions? I'll ask it so everybody can Okay, my question about cutting the tree down is how much um, of the tree do you take down at a time? So, uh, he will uh, make a slight pie cut into the trunk of that tree, and he'll just wrap it around once and put the sling in that pie cut so that we won't lose the bark and have the log drop. Another thing we do for safety is if we're going over people's homes, we do not let anyone in the house if we're going over the top of a structure. So we'll have to coordinate with the homeowners just in case, because if we drop one of these logs from 200 feet, it's going through the foundation. Last year we didn't really have any snow, so that wasn't a concern, but even the, we get the heavy Sierra cement snow, you'll see the ponderosa pines bend over. Green trees, they move, and that's a good thing when you see them sway, and with the dead trees, they don't sway, and so that's, that's the scary point. So, um, you know, of course, our goal is to get these trees down before any winter storm hits. We would love to see snow, but we'd like to get as much work done beforehand. <laughs> well, the beetles that are here in the fall, if we get, if it turns nice and cold and we get a good winter here, they'll stay uh, until it warms up a little bit in the springtime and then they'll come out. They might even come out during the warm period in January, actually. It would seem logical that it's going to go <laughs> So we wanted to start to set it down. Oh wow. Wow. <laughs> oh wow. That is amazing. 40,000 pound test. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have anybody under the line. We keep everybody out of this drop zone. Once we get this tree set down with its butt on the ground, we'll have one of these guys come in with a saw to trim up limbs so that we can safely lay it down. We'll pull the, the bottom end out and lay it down. And once we got the angle on it, we'll keep cutting branches off until we can have it secured on the ground. Will it go in a chipper? Uh, what it will do, we have a truck on the back side of this crane. It's got a big grapple on it. Mm -hmm. It's a huge semi-truck. And we pick it up with the grapple, drop all the material into that, and take it off to the engagement. They took it over there. Climber up there is going to stay up there until they drop the, the uh, swing back up to him. He'll then set it up again, repel down, make another cut. Once it's still going and we get those set up, they can take trees down pretty rapidly. Big old Charlie Brown so Christmas tree. The guy walking in there holds a bat in here. He's going to remove the limbs so that. They can lay down safely. Uh -huh. Thank you. 
for the kudos. They came over to my property last week. I've come from British Columbia where we have a fair amount of background with outrageous bark beetle outbreaks, predominantly the mountain pine beetle outbreak. I'm hearing the word unprecedented a lot in California and probably one of the reasons California hasn't experienced these really massive outbreaks before is you have very mixed conifer species in your forest here, so lots of different kinds of species, and you have very complex terrain. Western pine beetles attacking your ponderosa pine and your coulter pine. You've got a uh, mountain pine beetle more likely than western pine beetle attacking your sugar pine. You've got Jeffrey pine beetle attacking your Jeffrey pine. So these are all different species of beetle that are co-evolved to attack different spe species of trees. And so what you have is this condition of very warm winters, which makes it so your beetles are surviving the winter really well. So they are hibernating during the winter. You know, they go dormant, they kind of die a pause. Uh, they just hang out under the bark over the winter time. But these nice warm temperatures that are increasingly being experienced in the winter make it so a lot of those beetles survive. They reemerge the next, the next spring and they start their life cycle over where they reemerge and they're looking for new green trees to attack. And, you know, in these, in these stands, uh, you know, you'll have maybe three or four ponderosas that are attacked. They come out and they go, oh, there's some more ponderosa, and then they just mass attack it. And usually what these trees do is they spit them out. They just produce tons of resin and sap, and they just pour it out. And you can see under sort of a non-droughty condition all these pitch tubes, and those are the beetles actually being ejected by the tree. Under these drought conditions, trees cannot allocate that kind of resources to sap flow. They're just hanging on trying to survive. And so it becomes a double-edged sword in a way. You have really good winter survival, and you have trees that are kind of sitting ducks because they can't evoke the normal response that they would to defend themselves. And so your population just keeps increasing and increasing. Uh, in western pine beetle, you tend to have around two generations of, of beetles created a year in the central and northern parts of the Sierra. In the southern parts of the Sierra, and it's, I'm not sure exactly where the line is because I'm so new to the state, you have four generations of beetle produced a year. This is a really high population. So even if we were to start to see the drought abate, you're going to see bark beetle mortality persist for a number of years still because they're not going to immediately respond. To, you know, the trees aren't going to immediately be able to respond. There's going to be this lag effect uh, from the drought ending to the trees regaining some sort of natural vigor. The best you can hope for with direct control mechanisms, either injecting insecticides, which research really still needs to bear out whether that's uh, truly effective, or using anti-aggregation pheromones. So this is a mimics a chemical the beetle produces that says, trees full, go away guys. Um, these are really at a small scale that you can evoke these types of measures. So this is uh, individual tree protection. And in some areas of California, this is a lost battle already, but where you have low numbers of beetles, so just, just where your beetles are starting to increase in population, you can make a dent in that population by cutting down the trees that are still green, but they're full of beetle. When they're full of beetle, even if their crown is green, they're dead. The tree just doesn't know it yet. So for example, where we were watching the tree being felled today with the crane in the foreground of that excluded area, and I couldn't verify this because we weren't supposed to go over the barrier, but there was a standing green tree that looked to me like it was mass attacked. That's going to be a dead tree next year. If we could remove that tree at the same time, because there's ways of verifying that these are mass attack trees, then this might help with some of the multiple passes we're having to make through these areas. Also in these areas with less tree mortality by bark beetles, where you're not having 85% of the trees wiped out, you might actually reduce the beetle population by a really active sanitation um, program. And that's removing those trees while the beetles are overwintering and getting them out of the woods. They're, the beetles are destroyed when you uh, debark the trees, and you're effectively removing you know, thousands and thousands of beetles from re-emerging and attacking new trees the next year. We're going to be working hard this winter to sort of develop an extension uh, program around proactive management, helping people learn about the different tools and the different um, exemption processes they can evoke to sort of uh, try to manage uh, the trees that are kind of sitting ducks that are either green and dead or, or going to be going to be dead in the future.